making plans for Nigel. This boy is electric. Hi everyone, welcome back to the EV Puzzle. It's Saturday the 1st of March. Time to give you an update on how we got on during February for all of our energy consumption and solar generation. But before I do, it's worth going back to the start just for those people that are new to the channel to say these videos represent um, evidence, if you like, a, a story, a journey for us going electric. And that's what it's all about. We started in 2018 going electric with an electric car. 2019, we added solar panels. 2020, we added more solar and battery storage. And it's gone on from year on year on year. We're now completely electric. So electric heating, electric house, electric cars, electric everything. And that way we're generating our own electricity and then consuming it so it's zero cost. And when we can't consume our own energy because there isn't enough solar, the sun doesn't shine 12 months a year here in the UK, then we're using the Octopus Intelligent Go tariff to import energy at very cheap rate, seven pence, store it in batteries and then use it from the batteries at times when there is no solar during the day. And that's working really well. We're not using any peak rate energy at all. So we don't pay 25 pence a kilowatt hour, 22 pence a kilowatt hour, whatever it is that other tariffs might be on. We pay seven pence a kilowatt hour because our technology enables us to use that cheap rate energy, which is only available between five or six hours in the early hours of the morning. That's how our energy bills are so small. We're just running on cheap rate energy. But then we go from small bills to no bills by exporting solar energy during the summer for a credit. And that credit then covers all of our winter usage at that cheap rate. The reason for doing this isn't to make a profit. The reason for doing this isn't to get payback on all of these devices. The reason is to have energy independence. If there's an energy price rise, we don't mind. If we want to use more heating in the winter or drive more in our cars, it's all for free. So we don't think about the energy costs related to it. We're not impacted by energy price rises. In fact, if the energy prices go up, that'll probably mean we'll be paid more for our export and be even more in credit. So energy costs are now not a thing for us. And that's something I wanted in our retirement. I wanted to feel free, independent, unencumbered. I wanted to have independence from energy bills and energy companies changing my direct debit and affecting how much money we have a month to spend on better things. Now we don't have any energy bills for gas, electric, petrol, diesel, oil, none of those things. It's all for free, paid for by the solar that we generate during the summer. But when I looked at our stats this month, one of the things that uh, struck me was that our savings, which I do track, uh, are about £12,000, just below £12,000 at the moment, savings on all of the solar and all of the batteries and all of these great pieces of technology we've installed. And the cost of our solar panels, all of the solar panels we've installed, is about £12,000. So we've just about reached the payback point for our solar panels. Now, obviously, that still leaves the Mixergy hot water tank, the air to air heating to pay for, and our batteries. So all of those things haven't been paid back yet. But I didn't expect it all to be paid back in five years. Now, I know some people like to talk about payback. I don't really mind about it. I'm doing it for you discussing this. But one of the things that's obvious is depreciation difference between solar panels and batteries. If I think about, yes, it's wonderful. I've had these savings and it's given me benefits to the extent of the same amount I paid for all of my solar panels. So they're paid back. That's wonderful. But they're not really worth a lot. Those solar panels, if I took them off the roof and tried to sell them, might be worth 10 or 20 pounds a piece. They're so cheap now that I may have paid 110 to 140 pounds a panel in the first place, but they're now worth just 10 or 20 pounds, at least 90% depreciation already. But batteries are different, aren't they? Because I spent roughly 12,000 pounds on the batteries. And if I wanted to sell them now, they're pylon tech batteries. They're compatible with all sorts of different inverters, all sorts of different systems. They're very marketable. So if I advertise them for sale now, I'm confident I'd get a good price for them. I'm confident that I wouldn't lose 90% of their value. How much do you think I, I might get back? 50%, maybe even more. So I don't actually have to pay back all of that value that I've spent on the batteries because they still have some asset value. If I wanted to sell them, I could get the payback from selling the batteries. So battery storage and solar panels work completely differently from a point of view of depreciation. So this month has been a very positive month for me. There's been lots of good positive observations of lower energy use and better solar generation from our system. So I'll go through those with the pictures and the rate over the top and let you know what I've seen when I've been analyzing our end of month numbers. 
So for February, our energy bill for the month was £56.37, with a credit for exported electricity of £44.09, so £12 net bill. Savings sessions aren't paying as much as they used to, but we still gained £3.06 this month in octopoints. So that's down to just a £9 net bill. The energy that we did import was 531 kilowatt hours, Octopus Intelligent Go, all at 7 pence per kilowatt hour. And as you can see on the line on the very right hand side of this graph, that's a lower level than many of the months last year. The daily chart from Octopus Energy hasn't been updated with the last day of the month, so I've updated that manually. 531 kilowatt hours, but as you can see, the peak, the highest there, 35 kilowatt hours. And it's not high because of heating, it's high because of lots of car charging. Because we're paid twice as much for exporting energy at 15 pence a kilowatt hour than we are importing energy at 7 pence a kilowatt hour, then we need to export half as much as what we import to end up with a net zero bill. And we have achieved that 272 kilowatt hours of export, just slightly more than half of what we imported. And yes, it was slightly more than January's export, so that's good news. But 272 kilowatt hours, it's tiny compared to what we can export in summer. This chart from my energy is pictorially a very good chart. It shows what's going on. In red, we've got import from the grid. So you can see that that's quite consistent across the month. In green, again, it's consistent. It's a base load that we're consuming. So solar energy being generated and we're consuming it with our base load of our house. But the export back to the grid, that's in yellow. And that only occurs on really sunny days where we have an excess more than the base load. So as you can see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, there's only... You know, less than half of the month we were actually exporting. So we exported 272 kilowatt hours, but we generated 382. So that means we consumed 110 kilowatt hours of that solar energy ourselves with the base load of the house. As you can see there, we had a couple of days in the middle of February where we had 35, 36 kilowatt hours um, generated. And on the last day of the month, that was a really good day on the 28th. That was 39 kilowatt hours. So our individual arrays, this is our 3.9 kilowatt array with a 3.68 kilowatt solace inverter. We generate 172 kilowatt hours with four days, just over 15 kilowatt hours being the peak for February. This is the array that's really good for comparison to many other people because this is the G98, you know, 3.9, 4 kilowatt array that's installed as standard by solar installers. Our east-facing gable panels and three solar panels on the garage roof, they generated 54 kilowatt hours and peaked at just over 5 kilowatt hours on a day. Our 2.4 kilowatt solar array that's mounted in our garden with six panels, six 400 watt panels, generated 60 kilowatt hours with a peak of 7 kilowatt hours on the last day of the month. And lastly, a great comparison to our garden solar array. This is another 2.4 kilowatts of solar panels, this time on our roof, south facing and using a solar edge 2 kilowatt inverter that generated 95.8 kilowatt hours. I'm doing a lot of comparisons between this solar edge array 2.4 kilowatts and our garden 2.4 kilowatt solar array to see the difference of having ground mounted panels that are still south facing but they're self-shading, so they're not all mounted in a line like the ones on the roof. They're mounted in front of each other, so they do shade each other in the winter. So it's very interesting to see 60 kilowatt hours from the ground mount, 95.8 kilowatt hours from the roof mounted. It's shade that's losing me those 35 kilowatt hours. Plugging those numbers into my chart that shows the comparison of other Februarys shows that 172 kilowatt hours on our main 3.9 kilowatt array is the lowest we've ever seen. 177 kilowatt hours was the lowest we'd seen last year, but we've even gone lower than that. And the same for Solar Edge, 96 kilowatt hours is lower than the 97 from last February. So a very, very poor solar February. But because we've got the 60 kilowatt hours from the garden array this year, we're going to see that for quite a few months now, that my generation overall for the month was actually half decent. January and February so far this year have generated 734 kilowatt hours, 0.734 of a megawatt hour. But compare that to 2024 for the entire year, we should be generating in the region of eight and a half megawatt hours this year or more because we've got that garden solar array in there. So hopefully more than nine megawatt hours. So we're a long way to go yet. 
This chart is showing the peak power generated by all of our solar rays together. And this is one of the good news stories for February. At the start of the month, we were barely generating six kilowatt hours uh, on some of the good days. And then it started to rise to seven kilowatt hours and then eight and uh, again, eight kilowatt hours in the middle of the month, but then breaking eight and even showing nine kilowatt hours on the last day of the month. So February really has been showing that peak power increasing very, very quickly as the sun rises higher in the sky and lasts longer. This is the same view of solar power coming through, but zoomed in on just that last day, the 28th of February. And you can see there from 10 o'clock all the way through to one o'clock, we're, you know, we're generating more than eight kilowatts, which is absolutely excellent to see that high level and the peaks into the nine kilowatts. I think the highest we've ever seen was 9.7. So as March, April and May come and the sun gets higher, that's when we'll see those really high values. The good news continues when we look at each individual array, the dark blue being the Solus inverter 3.68, 3.9 kilowatts of solar panels. It's peaking at 3.6 kilowatts. We're almost maxing out the inverter. The light blue line is going above 2 kilowatts. I've seen as high as 2.2, and that's the 2.4 kilowatt garden solar array. So the shade is disappearing, and we're now starting to max that out. Things are getting better. Again, more analysis between the Solar Edge 2.4 kilowatt array and our Garden 2.4 kilowatt array. We can see the Garden in light blue is capable of generating more. It's peaking just slightly above, but the shade is impacting it, especially in the afternoon, and we're generating less. But I'm wondering whether that's going to change in the months ahead, because it's pointing just slightly more west, and it's going to catch more final sun as well. So in the next few months, it'll be very interesting to see how this Garden array performs. I get quite a few comments about these solar panels that I put in the garden telling me I should have spaced them out further to get less shade. I should have raised the back ones up slightly, which would have reduced the shade on them again. Or I should have put them alongside the fence line. Then I would have had less shade. So lots of people are talking to me about how to improve these, how to optimize them. I should add some Tygo optimizers. And I am considering doing all of those things. But you have to remember, I was only planning to put four panels in to start with. And then I thought, well, if I move them a little bit closer together and squeeze six in, then I'll be able to generate more. So it doesn't really matter that I'm losing out with shade in the winter because I'm gaining from generation from having those two extra panels, the six. But it then makes me think, well, maybe I could squeeze them together some more and have eight. Maybe, eh? But the stats for this array are very, very interesting. If I look at the number of days that we have shade, so when the shade starts to affect these, these panels, it starts in mid-October and ends between the 19th and 23rd, 24th of February. Uh, that's when the shade has disappeared. So that turns out to be 129 days. And we generated 188 kilowatt hours in those 129 days, an average of 1.46 kilowatt hours a day. And interestingly, 82 of those days were when we generated less than 10 kilowatt hours in total for all of our systems. So that's 82 days of the 129 days. It was dull, in which case there's not a lot of point in optimizing it for those 40 days out of the three months. Then looking at the stats for what we achieved from when we first installed it in the middle of August through to that middle of October when we started to get shade, that's uh, just 66 days of generation that I've got here recorded, half the number of days, and yet we generated 347 kilowatt hours. So twice the number of kilowatt hours generated in half the number of days, and the average per day was 5.26 kilowatt hours. So as you can see, we need to optimize it for summer generation, not necessarily winter generation. It makes much more sense to add more panels than it does to optimize the ones that are there. But if I do touch this array again and make any changes, I will try to optimize it just a little bit more, even if it only saves another week or two weeks worth of shade. As I start to talk more about um, energy consumption, then temperature is quite important because that affects our heating costs. The colder it is, the more heating we need. The very bottom line of the chart here is our temperature gauge in our loft. So pretty much that's the outside temperature. And you can see how many days it's getting close to touching zero. It's also interesting to see the changing characteristics of the weather in the middle of the month between, what, the 6th or 7th of February through to the 17th, where temperatures are quite consistent. It doesn't seem to be dropping as much overnight. It's staying a similar temperature during the day and night. 
So on to usage and using the My Energy chart, we used 69.4 kilowatt hours heating our hot water through the Eddy uh, solar diverter into our Mixergy hot water tank. That's a nice low number, as is the Zappy, 111.5 kilowatt hours. We didn't drive very far this month. And house usage, 534.2 kilowatt hours, and that does include charging our home storage battery overnight. It's worth talking about our hot water system a little bit and how we actually use it. So we use the eddy as the timer to turn on the immersion inside the Mixergy hot water tank. So the eddy is set at 4 o'clock in the morning to come on and it only uses 2.1 kilowatts. I've turned the ampage down so it's not the full 3, 3.2. It's using just 2.1 kilowatts. And we charge that for an hour. So that's an hour from cheap rate at seven pence, which gives us about 25% um, of the hot water tank filled at the right temperature, about 54 degrees. Then when we get to 11 o'clock and two o'clock, I also do another quarter of an hour boost on the eddy. So if the eddy is in heating mode, I, it's not stopped and that timer is reached. And if the temperature of the hot water tank is below 48 degrees, then we turn the eddy on, which then uses that boost and heats the hot water tank a little bit. And then Home Assistant actually turns it off as soon as it reaches the 51 degrees that we want to hit. Rather than doing the whole 15 minute segment, that might only take five minutes. So we have these tiny little boosts that happen at 11 and 2 to reboost our hot water, to reboost it to the 51 degrees that I want as the minimum. That is working really, really well for us, meaning we have super hot water all of the time, but use the least amount of energy. So for us, hot water temperature is far more important than how much of it we have, so long as we have enough for our needs. So this chart shows, as you can see, we consistently heat up to 54, 55 degrees, and then it reduces down overnight to between 42 and 39 degrees. So the temperature is very, very good all of the time. Moving on to some more good news. All these individual devices are using less energy than they did last month. The Toshiba air conditioning system, our heat pump air conditioning, 126 kilowatt hours is less than January. The Zappi, 103.75 kilowatt hours. The Eddy heating our hot water, 69 kilowatt hours. Kitchen sockets, 44.6 kilowatt hours, including the oven and air fryer, etc. The ensuite towel rail, 40.8 kilowatt hours. The cloakroom towel rail, 37.8 kilowatt hours the infrared heater in the cloakroom 28 kilowatt hours the tv even that's lower 20 kilowatt hours the main induction hob 15 kilowatt hours the internet hubs all of them we've got three or four of them 12.1 uh, kilowatt hours laundry that's a dehumidifier drying eight kilowatt hours guest room heater seven kilowatt hours guest bathroom five kilowatt hours eddy heating from solar four kilowatt hours all of those are lower than they were last month. So collectively, we're using less energy. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope there's some good statistics there for you to compare with. And if you're thinking about going solar, I hope it encourages you and puts you in the right frame of mind with the right expectations of what to achieve with solar panels and battery storage. Uh, just as a side, I'm filming on a mobile phone camera this time, connected to my Rode external microphones. Uh, let me know if the uh, video quality and audio quality are okay, and whether you can tell the difference from my previous videos. Uh, I've gone for this new mobile phone with a better camera, so that I've got more flexibility in how I film, and also better options for 4K in the future. I'm not quite ready to edit in 4K, but uh, I can definitely now film in 4K. Thanks again for watching. Take care. See you again soon for more videos. Bye for now.